Hey everyone, Pastor George here. Welcome to Wednesday morning Bible study, and we are going to be going through Exodus chapters 10 and 11 today, because 11 is only like 10 verses, so it's not really going to be that much to add on, and, and that way we can really dive into the meat that is in the chapter 12 next week. So, uh, before we jump into it, just uh, join me in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, time that we have to study your word. We just ask this morning that you remind us of all of the wonderful things that you have given us, uh, all of the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, and we praise you for those, Lord. We confess that we are sinners, but we thank you for the gospel in Christ Jesus, that he died for sinners, and uh, and we are thankful for that. Lord, we just ask that you bless our reading of your word this morning, that we are able to learn new things about who you are and about what the promises to your people have been and continue to be. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so let's just do a little bit of, of context work again. So we are on the eighth plague today, starting in chapter 10. Egypt has gotten hit over and over uh, again and again, uh, and Pharaoh has been embarrassed. Uh, the last plague was a very devastating one, which was the plague of hail. Um, and the plague of hail is important because Egypt's economy has just been completely annihilated because it's destroyed the crops and the fields, which was Egypt's way of uh, sustaining itself. So because of that, uh, we are going to see the Egyptians react a little to that today. Uh, but uh, that is what's been going on. So it's getting worse and worse for Pharaoh and for Egypt while the people of Israel have been spared. So let's uh, dive into the text. I'll give you some time to read it over and then I will see you on the other side. So you've read Exodus 10 and 11. Uh, let's jump into it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So uh, Pharaoh's uh, will has been once again uh, strengthened by God, right? That Pharaoh has hardened his heart against them. Um, and uh, we have a continual sign in, in the verse two of kind of the point of, of all of this, right? So these are not just things that Pharaoh is doing to punish, uh, that God is doing to punish Pharaoh and to punish the Egyptians, but it also serves this double purpose of bringing uh, people in uh, in Egypt uh, to understand who God is, but also the Israelites, and not just the people living at the time, right? It's supposed to be this continual remembrance uh, why God, that God is God and what he has done in the past is still uh, important. Um, and of course, the whole point among this, not just for the Egyptians, but also for the Israelites, is at the very end of verse 2, I've done all this among them, that you may know that I am the Lord, right? That's actually a callback to when he is, uh, God manifests himself in the burning bush and he's talking to Moses, right? He's doing all of this so the people know who their God is. So you got kind of the mission statement of Exodus in this verse or a, re, or a retelling of it. All right. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover over the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left uh, to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and all of the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on the earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. So Moses goes in, declares these things in the name of God, um, and, uh, and, and Pharaoh uh, is, is told here that locusts are going to come. Locusts are insects that eat plant life, right? They're especially devastating for crops and things like that. And of course, as you remember last time, the hail wiped out a good uh, majority of the Egyptians' crops, and the locusts are coming to take whatever's left, and they're going to be a nuisance. Not only are they going to stay out in the fields, they're going to be in houses. 
And uh, it's not uncommon in this region of the world to have locust swarms, right? Uh, but God is letting Pharaoh know and all the Egyptians know that this isn't going to be a locust swarm like your, your pappy and your grandpappy taught you about. This is going to be a real locust swarm that no one will see here and forevermore type of thing, right? It's not going to be uh, like anything ever seen. And so they, uh, they say this, and, and um, <clears throat> then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? So you have them reacting to what has happened by the hail, right? That Egypt as a system has been completely destroyed. Its economy has been, um, has been ruined uh, because of the hail and will be even more so after the locusts. So they're just saying, don't you understand that you, we've lost everything, essentially? Just send them away, right? <clears throat> So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but which ones are to go? So he asks uh, Moses and Aaron that, you, you know, you can leave, but which of you are going to leave, right? Or, uh, who's going to go serve him? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. So this is a, a quick way of saying everyone, everyone is going to go, right? But he, Pharaoh, said to them, The Lord be with you if I ever let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. Uh, you kind of have some irony there, right? He says, The Lord will be with you if you ever let you and your little ones go. He's obviously, this is more of like a when pigs fly type of reference thing, right? But Pharaoh is it ends up kind of being proven correct in, in this and in that, yes, the Lord will be with them as they leave and, and uh, as the little ones leave with him, right? Um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, where were we, where were we, where were we, uh, the Lord be with you if I, no, go, uh, you, look, you, you must have some evil purpose in mind, right, so, uh, he's thinking that they're going to try and lead a rebellion, right, that they can gather all their people together, um, and essentially what Moses, what the Pharaoh was hoping to do here was hold the people as hostage, right, so if all the men leave, then the men can go do this thing, um, but of course, if the men leave, then those are the warriors, right? So they might go and arm themselves and come back uh, and try and take over Egypt as, in some sort of rebellion. And so Pharaoh is saying, uh, no, I'm not going to allow your kids to leave because uh, you're probably going to try and take over. So I'm going to hold them as hostages, essentially, right? So if you try anything, we'll just execute them. So you must have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's prep presence, right? So he says, no, I'm not going to let you do that. If anyone can go, it's the men. Leave. And he tells them they leave. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand uh, over uh, the land of Egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So he does. Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind <clears throat> upon all the land that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. So normally the locusts follow patterns and things like that, right? So this idea that the, the east wind is carrying him. Again, we get a naturalized explanation for what's happening. But of course, it's a miraculous naturalized explanation, right? The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. Uh, again, it's not stated we could assume that this from the last the change in how the plagues have been focused that this probably excludes the places that the israelites were right they covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left not a green thing remained neither tree nor plant of the field though all the land throughout all the land of egypt right so now everything is gone then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. So we have Pharaoh do this thing again, right, where he acknowledges that he's sinned against them um, during this time. Uh, and so, uh, it, you know, he does it pretty, uh, what did my uh, translation said, hastily, right? He does this pretty quickly. Um, and so he uh, uh, probably realizes how much peril Egypt is in now. Now, therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once, 
uh, and uh, plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. Again, you kind of have this interesting kind of foreshadowing of what's to come if you guys know the story of Exodus, uh, the final plague, um, which we'll get to tonight. Or not tonight, this morning. It is the morning still. Um, and so uh, he uh, went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. This is Moses, right, going and saying, all right, uh, let uh, go. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea, right? So he gets rid of all the locusts. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the people of Israel go, right? So the, the Pharaoh once again reneges on his promise here. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of evening. a darkness to be felt. We kind of have a very poetic thing there, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So you have Egypt uh, being covered in darkness. Now, the interesting thing about this is and this is one of those plagues, again, that has very religious and symbolic meaning as well. So the chief god of the uh, Egyptian pantheon was the god Ra. Uh, depending on when it, it could have been Amun or Amun-Ra, they kind of end up having different names and stuff like that. It's I'm not going to get it too much into it. But think of Ra as being the same or the equivalent of Zeus from the Greek pantheon or Odin from the Norse pantheon, things like that, right, where they're the chief god of the whole system. And so Ra kind of is that uh, thing. And Ra's personification is the sun. And you can understand that in a world where darkness brought a lot of danger with it, right? Not only from animals, but all, you know, from all sorts of things because they didn't have electricity or lights, easy lights to just, you know, shine and not have to worry about being trapped in the dark that the sun was a very important thing, right? People woke up and went to bed with it, right? So it was a long, uh, important practice that the sun was an important god to the Egyptians. Not only that, but of course, they recognized the importance of the sun when it came to uh, growing crops and things like that. So the sun, very important to uh, the Egyptians. And the fact that this the sun is being darkened, that their chief god has been diminished and, uh, you know, uh, put under the heel of the god of Israel, uh, is to send a signal, right? It's to say that I am who I say I am, right? I am who I am. Um, and of course, we have the people of Israel being able to still enjoy the sun in the normal day and light cycle and all that type of stuff. Um, then Pharaoh called Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. So again, Pharaoh has these moments where he realizes, but he doesn't want to let the whole thing go, right? He doesn't want to give in. He wants to negotiate. And so first it's, okay, your men can go, but everyone else can't. And now it's, okay, every all the people can go, but all the stuff you own has to stay here, right? But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for uh, we must take them to serve the Lord our God, and we do not know what we with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. So, of course, animals are not only, you know, useful property for farming and stuff like that, but, of course, they serve important things in the sacrificial system. So they're like, please let, we need it. We need the animals because we have to worship him and we'll need to have sacrifices. And if we don't have sacrifices, then what are we going to do, right? Um, uh, but the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And then Pharaoh, so you have Pharaoh maybe uh, seeing that this is the case, but then he has a change of heart. Uh, brought on by the Lord. But again, the Lord only gives us what we want. So Pharaoh wanted to do this. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me and take care never to see my face again. For on the day you will see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. So uh, Moses and, and Pharaoh have their final falling out here and Moses is, is sent away. And now we get to chapter 11, which is the final plague being talked about. Um, and uh, we have an interesting thing here, uh, which is uh, 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 the uh, we have the one more plague thing. Remember, I talk of plague is an interesting word, has like this idea of strike. And so you have like the idea of the final blow coming here. So the Lord said to Moses, yet one more plague I'll bring upon Pharaoh. Uh, 
and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Um, and so he uh, sends, uh, he says that this is going to be the last thing that happens, and then he will let you go. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and the sight of the people. So Moses actually kind of becomes, not a hero is, is correct, but a, a respected person among the Egyptians, right? Uh, especially people that hate them. And the Jews themselves, the Hebrews themselves, are being honored by the Egyptians. And this will end up, uh, as they leave, the Egyptians are going to be giving them gold and silver to just like make them leave, that type of stuff, right? So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill, and all of the firstborn of the cattle. So you have the, the final thing, which will be the death of the firstborn. And uh, this is obviously important in a society where uh, many children die in childbirth, and, and it's firstborn children especially vaunted um, because they're going to be inheritors, especially sons. Um, but just in general, it's important to have these uh, people in your society uh, and uh, they're very meaningful. And of course, he has this thing from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the slave girl at the hand mill. Um, the work of, you know, it was grinding corn, right? And that was the lowest possible job that the slave could have. It was very menial. Um, it was only done by slaves and prisoners of war, right? So it's not a very positive thing. So you have him striking everyone, right? No one is going to be left untouched by this, from Pharaoh to the lowest of the low to the animals. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel, right? Driving the point home, Israel is the people of God. Egypt has um, harmed them, and Egypt will pay, right? And all of these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all your people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And so um, people... Uh, uh, will come to Moses and bow down and just beg him to leave, and then he will leave. And he went to Pharaoh, went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. So Moses is is finally, you know, getting getting into it a little bit. It's about time, you know. Then the Lord said uh, to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Yet again, though, doesn't matter what you say or how you say it, Pharaoh is not going to listen to you, and all this will happen just to show that I am who I am, right? Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. And so you have a kind of final summation of these first nine plagues, that Moses and Aaron did all these things before Pharaoh, and none of them were able to make him change his mind completely. And so uh, he, they are not going to be let out. And of course, the uh, plague that a lot of people, and this is, you know, this is the end of our reading, the plague that most people have a problem with out of all of these despite the fact that they're all very destructive and things like that, is this one, right? This idea that all of these kids, uh, some of them are going to be kids, some of them are going to be adults, but, but generally, you know, children uh, are going to die, right, in the land of Egypt, that the firstborn will die. And kind of what does that mean? Isn't that kind of an overkill on God's part? And we've kind of talked about this, well, that was kind of funny. <laughs> Way of phrasing it. Uh, we've talked about this before, right? That this idea that God's uh, going to judge these people and hold them accountable um, is for the beginning of this book, right? You have to remember how the Israelites were being treated by these people. Um, and God is also going to use this as a time to distinguish uh, himself as someone who cares uh, not even about necessarily ethnicity, but about who's willing to follow him. Um, and we're going to get into that next week. But you have this idea that there are people who are going to stand outside of God's will and against him, and they are going to be judged harshly, right? Because justice uh, demands that, you know, you need to punish people. You can't just let people go um, or else, you know, justice doesn't mean much of anything. Um, 
Although we, we see actually that Mercy is continuing an option if you've been kind of following me and reading between the lines. Uh, but you also have uh, God bringing justice. And so that's kind of where uh, Exodus is, is big on, especially when it, in this first part, the most famous part of the book of Exodus, when God is talking with the Egyptians and uh, Moses is pleading with them, to uh, pleading with Pharaoh anyway, to change his mind. And uh, so you have uh, this final gauntlet being thrown down. And we're going to get into what that entails next week. So uh, that is Exodus 10 and 11. Uh, thanks for joining me, guys. I'm going to pray us out, so please join me in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had together to study your word. Uh, we just ask that as we leave this place that we remember that you are the Lord, that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, and that you control all things and you are sovereign over our lives. Uh, Lord, we ask that you remind us of this when we struggle or, or fall, um, that you do have uh, justice on your mind and that we should care about justice and especially punishment for sins, but that that punishment was taken for us on the cross. So Lord, we are thankful uh, for that. And we just ask that you give us a heart to seek out injustice and uh, expunge it from the world as your servants. Um, Lord, we just ask that uh, while also always having a hand open in mercy and in love, as you always have. Uh, Lord, we ask that we, as we leave this, this week that you be with those in our lives who are sick or in need of uh, prayers and, and healing um, for anything, Lord. We just ask that you bring that to them, that doors will be open for people who need it. And Lord, we ask that uh, you lead us safely from this place until next week when we're able to meet again uh, so that we can continue to read your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone, thanks for joining me. I will see you guys next week for chapter 12 of Exodus. Peace out.